In this video, I will be using some Hebrew names for people, places, and things because there's much revelation and understanding of scripture that comes from the perspective of the original language, which is Hebrew. As a matter of fact, when we look at scripture through the lens of the original pictographic Hebrew and recognize the imagery that is throughout scripture, we then position ourselves to begin to gain more of the intended fullness of understanding of the word of Yah. As a matter of fact, 1 Corinthians 10 verse 11 tells us that there were things that happened to our forefathers so as to be recorded for us as examples or types and shadows where principles of truth could be revealed to us in these latter days and serve as warnings for us. Also, in the Renewed Covenant or New Testament, we see the Messiah's use of the imagery of parables to teach invisible principles of truth by means of the attributes or characteristics and functions of physical material objects, which were then used in storylines so as to illustrate the, the lesson that was being taught by Messiah. Matthew 13, verses 12 to 15, Messiah Yahushua explains that the matters of the kingdom, however, are spiritually discerned because Elohim is spirit, Ruah, and his word is spirit. And he came to heal and restore our relationship with he who is the set-apart and righteous spirit, our creator and maker, Yahuwah is his name. Now, the problem is that over the past 2,000 years, the influences of the Roman Empire under the Emperor Constantine have resulted in the blending of pagan religious rituals, which over time has brought about an embracing of the Hellenization of Scripture. And this has put us in position of having to recover a true understanding of all of Scripture, and that happening bit by bit, which then brings us to our topic at hand. Now, this is part three of our series called, But Who Do You Say That I Am? In this series, we've been talking about this question that Messiah first posed to his disciples 2,000 years ago, because it's still a valid question for those who are called to follow him today. The question concerns the true identity of Messiah Yahusha, who some call Jesus. Now, this being part three, let's do a bit of a review of what we have covered thus far. In fact, because of the nature of this study, we're going to do a little more than a review. We're going to connect some of the dots of what we've covered so far. So let's start with looking at the matter of spirit or ruah in Hebrew, which is key and essential in our having a proper understanding of the answer to Messiah's question. Yehokanan or John chapter 20 verses 21 to 23. Yahusha said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending 
you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Ruach Kadesh. End of quote. Now, this takes place immediately after the resurrection of Messiah. He who was sinless had taken upon himself the sin that had separated us from the Father, and in death he provided forgiveness for our sins. But then he accomplished the purpose for which we were forgiven. With the giving of the Ruach Kadesh, commonly called the Holy Spirit, so as to restore our souls with his governing presence, making us whole and complete. That is to say, giving to us shalom, peace, by means of the gift of the kingdom of Yah, which is expressed with the living word of the Father, giving to us an ear to hear, and empowering us with a heart, a spiritual heart, to obey his word from within. So we take no credit for our obedience because it's he who has empowered us to be and to do according to his will, which is his word made operative in our lives. In fact, it was prophesied in Isaiah 9 verse 6 that the government would be on his shoulders. So let's look at that. Isaiah verse, I'm sorry, Isaiah 9 verse 6. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty Elohim, Everlasting Father, Prince of Shalom or Prince of Peace. End of quote. Now, Isaiah 9 6 is a prophecy of our Messiah who entered the stage of history 2,000 years ago. And here, Isaiah, or Yasha Yahu, was anointed by the Ruach Kadesh to tell of the promised Messiah. Isaiah writes that a child would be born and a son would be given. Now, this speaks of the dual nature of Messiah, which explains that while Mary gave birth to the Son of Man, which is Yahusha according to the flesh, she did not give birth to the Son of Elohim which is Yahusha according to the Ruach, because this verse explains that the Son was given. Genesis 3.15 speaks of our promised Messiah as the seed of the woman, which by the witness of two scriptures reveals that Messiah was not born of the seed of a man, which then points back to uh, the gift of the son of Elohim placed in Mary's womb by the Most High, Yahuwah, which of course discredits the doctrine of the Catholic Church who worships Mary as the, quote, Mother of God. End of quote. Also, in this verse, we are told that Messiah would be called Wonderful Counselor. 
And among Trinitarians, the wonderful counselor is understood to be the third person of the, quote, Godhead, which is a term used in the King James Version of Scripture. So, other than here in Isaiah, where do we see reference made to the wonderful counselor? Well, one place would be Yahukanan, or John 14, verses 26 to 28, where Messiah says that the wonderful counselor is Ruah Kadesh, but does not say that Ruah Kadesh is one of three persons known as Elohim. And we're going to look at a very interesting verse, which clarifies the truth of this, this matter and therefore clarifies what is being said here in Isaiah 9, 6 as well, because it explains how Isaiah 9, verse 6 says that Messiah would be called Wonderful Counselor and Everlasting Father which is also here in this verse. And of course, we will look at another verse on that point as well. But speaking of imagery, let's look at another place where we see this image of the government being on Messiah's shoulders. Matthew 11, verse 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. End of quote. Now, yoke is one of those words, like leaven, where we really begin to understand that it is the characteristics and functions of the thing which is being used for illustrating and explaining something. And so the thing itself is not necessarily good or bad. Leaven in and of itself is not good or bad. A yoke in and of itself is not good or bad. And that's what we're about to see. So, for example, in, in Exodus 12, verse 15, we're instructed to remove all leaven from our houses before Passover. Because in this case, leaven is being used as a type and shadow of sin. But then the primary characteristic of leaven is also used to describe the kingdom of Yah. In Matthew 13, verse 33. In both cases, it is the primary characteristic of leaven which is being used as an illustration of how just a little bit of something can be mingled with something else, and then that which was little to begin with spreads throughout and causes that which it is mixed with to rise or increase. And that's whether for good in the case of the kingdom or for bad in the case of sin. And so it is with the word yoke. It is used in several places to speak of a bondage to sin. So, for example, Galatians 5.1. But here, we can see clearly that the yoke of Messiah speaks of the security and guidance of walking with Messiah. And so here we see that the function of a yoke is used to illustrate the word teach. This is a picture of the Hebrew word 
to teach, which can be translated as either yara or lamad. Yara comes from a root word, which means rain. And so it speaks of influence that drives in a certain direction, like a driving rain. And so we see Yara as in the name Yara Shalem, Yara Shalem, which means teaching of Shalom or teaching of peace or teaching of wholeness. Because that's what that word shalom means. It's, it's, um, it's translated as peace in English, but um, it actually means wholeness or completion. And so Yerushalayim is commonly called Jerusalem, which in scripture is called the city of David. David's name means beloved. And so we see a reference to the gathering of the beloved of Yah and the renewed teaching of wholeness and completion coming down from Shamayim or the heavens. When we put all the literal names together, Hallelujah. And then we also have the word Lamad, which is actually a character of the Hebrew Aleph bed. And it's a picture of a shepherd's staff, which uh, speaks of teaching with authority, as the shepherds would often use their, their staff to goad and to guide the flock. And this illustrates teaching because, according to scripture, learning is not the accumulation of data, but rather learning is that which we do with what we hear. And we see that also in Romans 2, verse 13, where we're told that it is not the hearers of the law, or Torah, but the doers who are justified. And again, the word law is Torah, which means teaching and instruction. And so again, we see that the original Hebrew language and culture reflects the heart of the Father. And it is very different from the mindset which is cultivated by the world. And so in scripture, both Messiah and Ruach Kadesh are referred to as teacher, but not as two persons, which we'll see in just a moment. Now, this picture language would speak volumes to um, an agrarian people who worked the land and more likely than not had direct experience with how oxen were used in the cultivation of the land. What the farmer would do is to pair a stronger, more experienced ox with one who needed to be led and taught how to do the work. And so one of the two of these is the leader and the other is learning by following. Not just hearing, but doing. They are yoked together so as to aid in their walking together. And the leader carries the brunt of the weight because he knows in which direction to guide the other and when to make necessary turns and adjustments. Now, where else do we see the symmetry? 
Luke 9, verse 23. Then Yahushua said to all of them, If anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his crossbeam daily and follow me. End of quote. So here, Messiah Yahushua is saying, if anyone wants to be his disciple, his one of his Talmudim or students, and be taught by him, it is a decision which is reflected in our daily lives. In our daily lives, we must give up our own way of doing and take up our crossbeam, which is a picture of denying the flesh, the position of leader in our lives. And flesh or self is more than the body. It is the mindset of the natural man. It is self. Now, the yoke of the Ruach Adesh governing our souls, commonly called the Holy Spirit, is the set-apart and righteous spirit of Yahuwah, first given to us in bodily form as our Messiah, who is the full counsel of the word of Yahuwah made flesh. In Greek, the full counsel of the word of Yahuwah is the word logos. And then the Ruach Kadesh is given as a gift and placed within us when we're born again and we're given the voice of his word. And in the Greek, the word of Yah given um, giving guidance for specific situations is Rhema, which is what we see in Ephesians 6 with the sword of the spirit and the belt of truth. And so let's read that again. Matthew 11, and let's start at verse 28 and go to 30. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And so the daily shepherding of our souls causes us to walk in such a way that cultivates the soil of our hearts and makes it good ground in receiving the seed of his word. This is the government of the kingdom within every born-again believer, giving to us to walk in the law, or Torah, which again means teaching and instruction of Messiah. And by the way, that word Torah comes from that same Yura. Of course, you can hear that. Now, Isaiah 9, 6 again says that the child was born, but the son was given. And John 3, 16 says the same, that the father gave the son, who we then see as our Messiah anointed with the fullness of the presence of Yahuwah so that we could learn to walk with the leading of the still small voice of the living word of Yahuwah and become sons, as little as sons, of Yahuwah, led by the Ruach Kadesh of Yahuwah. And again, in the realm of the Spirit, 
sun is not gender specific. Instead, it speaks of function and characteristic. And so we see the flow of one person, the Father in heaven, Yahuwah, functioning on earth according to his own original statutes and then becoming our kinsman redeemer according to the flesh so as to legally redeem us since the transgression was committed in the flesh. And uh, redemption necessarily then came in the flesh. And so when we see the fullness of Yahuwah appear in a human body, he does not become another person, nor does he become a different person when he gives to each of us to be, to by measure, not fullness, but by measure, be the temple of his Ruach Kadesh, his set apart and righteous spirit. He is one person made manifest in diversity of function according to his sovereign plans and purpose. There's undeniable imagery all over scripture which tells of who Messiah is. But let's take one example from the picture uh, in the top left of our slide where we see an image of the Ark of the Covenant as described in Exodus with two messengers or angels facing each other with the presence of the Most High in the center. Now, as we move over to the next image, we see a depiction of the scene in the tomb where the body of Messiah was laid. The two messengers are facing each other with the body of Messiah laying between them. And you know, it becomes obvious that the imagery is purposely recorded as a matter of confirmation of who Yahusha is. John 14, verses 16 to 18, Messiah speaking. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. End of quote. So, wait a minute. Did he say that the third person of the Trinity would come to us? No, he said that he would come to us. That was Messiah Yahusha speaking. And as a matter of fact, nowhere in Scripture is there ever any mention of a third person of a trinity. You see, after we're born again, in other words, after we have received Ruach Kadesh, the set-apart spirit of Yahuwah, the only way that we don't see these things is because we've been conditioned not to see it. As a matter of fact, most who have come to see this come from some sort of church background where we were taught 
not to see this. And that's a big part of um, mainstream Christianity. But our Messiah, Yahusha, whose name means Yahuwah saves, is the exact image of the Father, so that through the Son, the Word of the Father became flesh. And so it is, the Father is who is revealed to us as He fathers our spiritual hearts, that we be not orphaned anymore. Which brings to mind again Isaiah 9, verse 6. Remember, his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, which speaks of the Ruah Kadesh. And here Messiah says, I will come to you when speaking of the Wonderful Counselor. And so we see the Father and Messiah not only here, but let's also make reference to another verse. John 14, verses 5 to 10. Philip said to him, Lord or Master, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Yahushua said to him, Have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. End of quote. So how can that be so? Well, it's because Elohim is Ruah, spirit. And he is not confined to the functionality of natural man. We like to think of the Father only being in the highest heaven. But Isaiah 66 verse 1 tells us that heaven is his throne and earth is his footstool. And as we carefully consider scripture, we see that he has always had a presence here. And the um, Torah and prophets or Old Testament bears witness of this. As we consider these few images, we, we see the Ark of the Covenant for which Yahuwah gave instructions on how to build since it served as a physical representation of a spiritually a, a spiritual reality which is invisible next to that we see images of the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night which pictured the presence of yahuwah leading israel through the wilderness Below that, we see Moses having a conversation with the Most High at the burning bush. And to the left of that image, we see a picture of the transfigured Messiah speaking with Moses and Elijah in front of the disciples. So surely, the book of Matthew was not his first appearance on earth. Messiah Yahusha is our kinsman redeemer, according to the flesh. 
And according to the Spirit, the Ruach Kadesh, he is our high priest, Malak Zadok, king of righteousness, commonly called Melchizedek, who is without beginning or end. As we put the pieces together, we begin to see that it was Yahuwah revealing himself to us in a coat of flesh that we may wear a garment of salvation and be robed in righteousness. Heaven is his throne and earth is his footstool. And he has made his called out assembly his temple. Hallelujah. Now there are more verses which speak directly to our study at hand. And in part four, where we'll be looking at more verses which confirm that it was indeed Yahuwah in Yahusha doing the works. And you know, when we really wrap our minds around this truth, it's enough to make you fall in love with him all over again. Because he who is the eternal one, the sovereign one, the almighty one, the all-knowing and ever-present one, humbled himself and came to rescue us from the sin of pride which had separated us from him. And his purpose was so as to give us the gift of his presence forevermore. Hallelujah. Please join me in giving praise unto our Heavenly Father for the oil of anointing of his presence, which ministers ever so beautifully through the yielded vessels called acoustical praise in real Brazil. Thank you again for granting permission for the use of your musical creations. A link to their channel and a list of song selections heard in this video will be in the description box below. And I do so encourage you to all visit their channel for even more treasure. Hen, O Shalom Mishpaka, favor unto wholeness family. Please continue with us to part four of our study.